In John 21, after Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he showed up on the beach to cook breakfast for his disciples. While on one level, this event might be considered an ordinary event, the whole scene highlights how God can use ordinary things and people in extraordinary ways in accomplishing his plans and purposes. So don't get too comfortable in your current routine. God may have bigger plans for you. A smell can take you back to the past. You know what I mean? Whether it's a perfume that reminds you of your mother, or a cologne that reminds you of your father, the smell of your grandparents' house, the smell of your, your favorite meal, maybe that was made for you as a child, the smell of, of maybe an amusement park you grew up going to, even today when I go to Kings Island and I go to that old classic ride, the red, white, and blue ride, the racer, it takes me back to being a, a 10-year-old back when it used to go backwards. Or it could be a baseball dugout. For me, it was it's when you open up a can of tennis balls for the first time and you get that smell. It takes me back to many matches won and many matches lost. I'm not competitive. I lost yesterday. I've let it go. I haven't. It takes me a while. Could be the smell of popcorn at your neighborhood movie theater you grew up going to. Or it could be kind of a stinky smell, something that you don't like and isn't good. Could be the smell of a youth bus coming from a, back, from a long trip from Winterfest <laughs> or a young adult retreat. But what smells do, all these various smells, they're, they remind us of ordinary life. Because that's what they are. They're, they're nothing special about them. There's nothing super significant. But they're just part of ordinary, regular life. A part of the human experience as we use our senses and, and take in our surroundings. We do, th do that through smell. And in our search for significance and meaning in life, it can seem that the ordinary life might be viewed as, a, as an enemy or perhaps even a crutch. On the one hand, we might kind of view the ordinary mundane life sort of as an enemy. Meaning we're always searching for the next adventure, the next most exciting and, and best thing, the thing that brings the most joy and excitement. And when we don't find it, it's, it's a bit of a disappointment. Or on the other hand, in between life's adventures, life's excitements, or perhaps those adventures and excitements never quite come into fruition, we can use the ordinary life as sort of a crutch. As we go back, lean back on that, go to the ordinary life and the routine. But maybe, maybe that's not a bad thing. Maybe an ordinary, or an ordinary life and routine is not a bad thing. And so this morning what I want to do is I want to take a step into Scripture and to this story we see that for all intents and purposes is a very ordinary event, or at least so it seems. But I want us to stop and to smell these ordinary roses that we see in this story. And I hope through that we see the significance and the extraordinary in it. And so I take you to this present moment in John chapter 21, 19 through 14. Here, Jesus has already been resurrected, and his disciples are out fishing. And he, he's standing on the shore, and he calls them in. And he gives them this invitation this great invitation, but really sort of an ordinary invite that you and I could receive from a friend or a family member. And that's this. 
he says, come and have breakfast. And he invites them to come to the beach to take a seat in front of a fire. And he has a meal prepared for them. The text says, so when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already made and fish placed on it and bread. And the story is kind of unique, isn't it? It's not quite what you would expect. Jesus has been resurrected. He'd spent three years with his disciples, going around, doing ministry, preaching the word, transforming people's lives, healing people, drawing people in with this message of the kingdom that was coming. And you would expect an interaction with his disciples as he's resurrected to, I don't know, to be more intense, to be more exciting, to be... More okay, the kingdom's coming, let's go. But instead, he invites them on this beach. Nothing special about this beach. And he just invites them to a meal, to have breakfast. Probably this meal was like a meal that they had shared many, many times before. It was very ordinary. And as they're sitting on the beach, enjoying this meal. You can just imagine what it's like for them to, to take in this atmosphere that they have there on the beach. All the sounds, the feelings, the smells. You remember how I, I mentioned that smells can kind of take you back into the past. And for Peter, I kind of wonder what the apostle, the disciple of Jesus named Peter, Kind of wonder what he was kind of taking in in this moment as he's sitting with the resurrected Christ. I think Peter in particular, he would take in one of these smells on the beach. He would take in the smell of the fish that is cooking before him. And I think that would take him back to the past. And he would reflect on what had happened over the last three years. It would take him back three years earlier to the point that we're talking about here at Breakfast with Jesus. You see, three years earlier, Peter was not yet a disciple of Jesus. And he was going around and living an ordinary life. And for Peter, what that meant was he was a professional fisherman. And he and actually a couple other of the disciples of Jesus, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they were all fishermen by trade. And so we pick up with a passage, this flashback to Luke chapter 5 that Chad read for us. Not yet disciples of Jesus. They seem to have met him, but they don't really know him. But they're out there. They, they're out doing what they normally do. They're out in the deep waters fishing because that's what they do. And this isn't anything special, anything extraordinary. It's not an extravagant deep sea fishing trip that you and I might go on when we go to the, on our beach trip. But this is just their ordinary checking in nine to five job. This is what they do. This is their normal. And so like any other night, they've been out all night fishing. And like they do, they start the night with this hope. And they cast the net with a hope of, of bringing in a catch. And they draw it in and there's nothing. There's an anticipation of, okay, the more we cast through the night, we're bound to come up with something. And they, they cast it out. Draw it back in. And nothing. And then like any of us fishermen, they, they make that last cast with a bit of desperation. Okay, I'm going to get something. And like many of us, you fall short and end up concluding with the night, well, it's better to be out here than anywhere else, so, and you go on home. <laughs> and they draw the net in, and they bring it in, and they, they head back to the shores and just chalk it up to a bad day, bad night of fishing. And about that time, the sun is rising, it's time to come in, and Jesus, whom they knew of and were familiar with, he comes to the beach and he has a period of teaching and instruction. And after his teaching and instruction, he sees the two boats, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And he calls them over and he says, hey, I want you to, to cast your boats back out and to throw the nets back into the water for a catch. And as you'd imagine, Peter, the professional fisherman, the leader of the group, kind of reluctant. He says, Master, we've been out fishing all day, and we haven't got anything. It's, it's, it's pointless. But nevertheless, 
probably because at, at the very least, Peter saw Jesus as, as a respectable teacher, as someone people were kind of drawn to, and for whatever reason, he saw him as, as credible. And he doesn't want to disrespect this new up-and-coming teacher. And, and so Peter leads his, his fleet of two boats out there for them to go out and to make one last catch. And this, this catch, there's not much hope or anticipation here. Not even really desperation, just sort of probably a little annoyed and thinking, I've got to get on with my day. I was cleaning the nets. need to get ready for the next night of fishing. But nevertheless, Peter casts out the net. And to his surprise... Almost immediately, there's this tug. There's this sensation of, of, of weight pulling back. And it turns out, as we see in the text here, in verse 6, that this time their nets were so full that the fish began to, to actually tear the nets. And this wasn't ordinary. This wasn't normal for this to happen. In fact, it was extraordinary. It was, it was a miracle. It was outside of nature. It was a miracle. And every professional fisherman in that boat recognized that. And in fact, Peter, the leader of these professional fishermen, he recognizes that. And he comes face to face with the reality and the identity of Jesus. And it brings him to his knees as he's faced with his own reality of who he is and how he's lived his life so far. And he falls before Jesus, this teacher he had heard of and respected, but now he sees him as the one he needs to commit his life to, and he falls to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me, for I am such a sinful man. And what I find so, so interesting about this is Jesus doesn't actually disagree with him that Peter had not been living his life in a worthy way up to this point. But instead, Jesus gives Peter a bit, bit of a vision of the future and what's going to be coming in his life if he decides to follow him. And he says, he replies to Simon, don't be afraid. You have nothing to fear. But he said, you're going to remain a fisherman, but now instead of fish, you're going to catch men. And I just can't help but think as, as Peter is, is sitting there around the fire with Jesus, I can't help but think as he smells that fish, that, that that's what he's reflecting on. A meal with Jesus. Such an ordinary thing. Just eating breakfast. Jesus and his disciples who had, he had spent day after day with. And what Jesus had prophesied there and predicted for Peter came true. They had many fishermen stories through the three years of ministry together and as a group. Whether it was the story of the woman at the well the story of the healing of many hundreds of people, the story of the feeding of the 5,000, or when they caught the big one, the tax collector Zacchaeus, or the one that almost got away, Nicodemus. But all these stories they reflect on is they smell in that fish and, and take that in. But Jesus gives them this ordinary invitation, come and have breakfast. And we see that scene once more. It says, and they... They got out on the land and they saw the charcoal fire already made and the fish placed on it and the bread. They had taken in that smell of the fish, would have meant something to Peter. But also something that, a smell that would have meant a lot to Peter was the smell of the charcoal fire. Now if you're like me, you like a good smell of a charcoal fire. It smells good. Maybe for you it brings back memories of a summer night cooking out in the yard with your family or had friends and family over for a cookout. You get that smell of that charcoal fire. I really think as Peter would have smelled that charcoal, he would have had a lot of mixed emotions about it. And I don't think that they would have been pleasant. You ever have those? We've talked a lot about the pleasant smells that bring pleasant memories but maybe you take in a smell, or you hear a noise, or just something, some, something sensory that kind of reminds you of a low point in life. When things weren't so good, maybe you had a family or you had a loss, whatever it might be. And as Peter takes in that whiff of the charcoal fire, I think it would have taken him back to a, to a, to a low point in his life. 
And in fact, it wasn't that long ago. It didn't take that much digging to have this memory. It was just a few weeks earlier. You see, the disciples had spent a, a packed week of event after event, activity after activity with Jesus navigating Jerusalem. As he's going throughout Jerusalem, he was stirring the feathers and stepping on toes of the religious elite and of city officials and was starting to gain attention. People were starting to bring accusations of blasphemy against him, him claiming to be from God. And towards the end of the week, Jesus takes his disciples in the evening and they go into this garden and he says, we're going to stay up through the night. My time has come and we're going to, we're going to pray through the night. We're going to stay up all night and we're going to pray through the night. They're already exhausted and they go into that garden and they, they pray and that's what they do. And then tragedy strikes as one of Jesus' own disciples, Judas, then ambushes the group with a band of soldiers there to arrest Jesus. And that's what they do. Jesus willingly gives himself over to them, and then he is arrested and taken off to trial to, to stand against the accusations that he has committed blasphemy by claiming to be from God. But the real tragedy of this is that Many of the disciples flee. They run. A threat has come up and they flee. Except, except good old Peter. You see, Peter had made a commitment, and another disciple, but, but Peter had made a commitment. As Jesus had predicted days before, that, that you all will deny me. And Peter, eager Peter, steps in. He says, Lord, I would never deny you. Never going to happen. Made that commitment. And so Peter stayed with Jesus, and he trailed behind him in the, ba um, the band of soldiers. And they came to the courthouse where they were going to, Jesus was standing trial before the high priest and, and others. If you read those accounts in the Gospels, long series of trials. But Peter's out in the courtyard awaiting to hear the, the result of the trial. And he's not alone. There's a lot of people. They've gathered together, right? This is, there's a lot of people wanting to know what is going to happen to this popular teacher named Jesus. And as, as Peter's in the courtyard, he's waiting to hear the results of the trial with other people. His worst fear kind of comes true. As, as his master and his teachers there being on trial, Peter's recognized by someone in this crowd. And it's a woman, and she says, aren't you, aren't you one of the disciples of the man who's on trial? That's Jesus. And as you can imagine, Peter's feelings are all over the place. His, his master and teacher, he had given his life to. He had left all, was on trial, and now his own life's at risk. And now this, this woman identifies him, exposes him, and asks him this question. I guess you could say the irony of it, or maybe it's just coincidental, is that while Peter is being asked this question, we know from the accounts of those trials Jesus is being asked the very same questions of identity. Who are you? And time after time, Jesus is asked the question, are you the king of kings? Are you the son of man? Are you the Messiah? All these terms would be so charged for first century Jew and first century Jewish leader. He's basically claiming to be from God. They consider it blasphemy. And to those questions of identity and Finding out who he was, Jesus humbly but boldly answered, I am. I am he. Said it over and over again. And now Peter's faced with the same question. This woman asks Peter, are you a disciple of this Jesus who's on trial? And he not so boldly and probably with a shaky voice replies, I am not. There's that charcoal fire. Because as he's standing in this courtyard, it says, now the slaves and the officers who are all awaiting the results of the trial, having made a charcoal fire, same word as John 21, for it was cold and they were warming themselves, and Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. And you can imagine the anxiety Peter already feels, the sense of failure as he's now denied his Savior and his Lord, and it wouldn't be the first time. He would do it twice more for a total of three times 
that night. He would deny the Lord before others. So that's what that, that smell, that smell of charcoal fire had to have just been, been rolling around Peter's head as, as he sits here having breakfast with Jesus. And Jesus knows all this has happened already as he stands at that shore and he invites Peter and the other disciples. And he says, come, come have breakfast with me. And they just sit and have this ordinary meal. All this has happened, but Jesus is now resurrected. He says, come, Peter, come sit. Let's have breakfast. And they, have, they share a meal together as they had so many times before. And then again, it says, and so when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already made, fish placed on it, and the bread. This is the scene we have before us. Don't you wonder what they were talking about in this story? Like as they're having breakfast, all that has happened and all that's been done, you have to wonder what, what would they be what would they be talking about? Oh, to be a crab on that beach that day <laughs> and to, understand, to be able to hear those conversations and what were, were going on. But you're just kind of taking in the scenery as any of us would on the beach. You're sitting with Jesus, eating breakfast, sharing an ordinary meal. You feel that ocean breeze or that sea breeze. They're out, they're out of sea. You kind of take in that whiff of that, the water. As many of us probably have, whether wherever your favorite beach is or wherever you've gone or maybe your favorite lake you guys like to go to for a vacation or a weekend away. We all know that and the, just the memories that might go along, go along with that. And for all of the disciples, Peter included, as they're just reflecting on all that has happened, they take in that, that whiff, that smell of the sea breeze and would really just remind them of what happened a few moments earlier. On this day, here in John chapter 21, at the beginning of the chapter. And so we go a few minutes, a few moments, I should say earlier, right before Jesus gives this invitation to breakfast. As the Gospels record for us, Jesus was, in fact, found guilty. He was led away to be crucified on the account of blasphemy and insurrection. And as you would imagine, after he was humanely crucified and put in a tomb, imagine the turmoil, and we talk about this sometimes, but imagine the turmoil the disciples had to feel after that happened. They've given everything, forsaken everything to follow. This man who claims to be the king of the Jews, this man who claims that his kingdom is coming, new creation is coming, you give everything, you follow him. And now the one you follow who claimed to be bringing about new creation, has now been crucified and his lifeless body is sitting in an old tomb. No doubt they had confusion of what to do next. Like, what's our next step? What does life look like now after all of this? And even after Jesus was resurrected, as joyful as that might have been, it seems like they still kind of struggled what to do next. Now don't get me wrong, of course, they were celebrating, they were rejoicing, Jesus has been resurrected, and all that that meant for them. But I still think there was a struggle of, okay, well what does this look like now? Now that Jesus has been killed, he's been resurrected. What's, it, what's this look like for him to be king over a kingdom? What does it look like if this, you know, this kingdom turned out to not to be exactly what they thought it would be? They thought it would be a physical kingdom, would restore the kingdom to Israel over Rome. Turns out it didn't work out that way. What, what does this look like now? On top of that, the king, Jesus, keeps talking about one day he's going to depart. He's no longer going to be with them. He's going to send another, a comforter. But, you know, all these thoughts that are rolling in their head and just kind of this lack of knowledge of what to do next. And we've all been there before in a transition or in a difficult moment or what, what's the future look like? And that's kind of what, where they are before they, we see them having this breakfast with Jesus. And often when we struggle what to do next, as we've mentioned, we, were, we revert back to the ordinary. We do what we know. And for Peter, some of the other disciples, that was fishing. In fact, that's exactly what Peter says. One night, after they've already seen Jesus, he's appeared, he's resurrected, 
They've seen him twice. And one night, I think they're just struggling with this, what to do next. And, and Peter just says, listen, I'm going fishing. You revert back to what you know. And they're out there fishing. They're out there all night long again. Just like in that story in Luke chapter 5. And they start with hope of a big catch and they, they cast the nets out there. Nothing. They bring it in. And sort of with anticipation, if we cast enough, eventually we're going to catch something. And keep casting out. And nothing. And once again, with the desperation all of us fishermen have, you cast one more time, hoping for something. And once again, you have an, an empty night. Almost like this deja vu experience. Like we've seen this before. This has happened before. And then this man on the shore actually calls out to them. And we know from the text that this was actually Jesus. It says, at dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach. But the disciples could not see who he was, so they didn't know who it was. Jesus would kind of appear to them, and then he'd be gone. And then he would appear again, and then be gone. And so they weren't necessarily expecting this. And so the man on the beach, unbeknownst to them, Jesus tells them to throw your net to the right side of the boat, and you're going to find some fish. And I think they're just, they're just kind of grasping at this point. They're like, I, I don't know this guy. I'm just, we're just going to do it. Stranger things have happened in their three years. And so that's what they do. They, they cast that net one more time. And just like Acts chapter 5, they feel that sensation. The full net. And when they do, they were unable to haul the net because of the large number of fish. And there's no second guessing what's happening at this point. At this point, they know exactly who's standing on that beach. And one of the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. And everyone recognizes that only the Lord could do this. And it took them back probably to that first time when Jesus called them to follow him. When Jesus did this miracle of the, the, the loaded net of fish. And Simon Peter, eager Peter, he heard him say this, that it was the Lord. And he just jumps out of the boat into the water and starts running to the shore. So excited to see their Lord. And it takes us back to that present moment where once more, last time, Jesus gives that invitation, come and have breakfast after this miracle. And they come up to that scene. So, so when they got out on the land, they saw the charcoal, charcoal fire already made and fish placed on it and the bread. And then you got this beautiful scene where they just share a simple, ordinary meal together. It says Jesus came, he took the bread and gave it to them and same with the fish. And they just ate as they had done so many times together. So now there was a third time, there, this was the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. You know, Grady and I are doing this series together, <clears throat> and one of the reasons this story was picked, and to be honest, Grady picked this, this story, but is to highlight the fact that this is, yes, this is an ordinary meal. But if Jesus has taught us anything through his life and through his ministry, it's that that's where he does his work. It's through the ordinary, through the normal, the seemingly mundane. As Jesus uses ordinary moments to call us to extraordinary things. And I have to tell you, <clears throat> when I first began as a minister, young, right out of college, I honestly thought my mission, <clears throat> my job, was to call people out of the ordinary, forsake the ordinary, and to go and do the extraordinary. And that's not a bad thing. But I actually think I had it kind of flipped, if you will. Is rather than Jesus calling us apart from the ordinary <clears throat> to the extraordinary, I think he calls us into the ordinary to witness the extraordinary things he does in those contexts. That's what we've seen over and over again in his ministry. So whether it's the smell of an ordinary cup of coffee, at a Starbucks or a local coffee shop as you teach someone in an exciting way about the first time they're hearing about Jesus and you're able to see the light bulb bulbs go off and them start to see what God's been doing in the world and what he's calling them to or that same smell of the ordinary coffee and you're having a difficult conversation with a brother or sister in Christ talking about some hard things. 
or maybe that's the ordinary smell of a burger on the grill as we join together during our summer cookouts or other events, as we celebrate the kingdom together in fellowship. Or whether that's the smell of lasagna as you join in one of our groups that goes to City Gospel Mission just to serve an ordinary meal that makes a big difference in people's lives. Or that that's the, the smell of no food or the smell of food on the day that you've devoted yourself to prayer and fasting as you've devoted yourself to the Lord. These ordinary moments. Maybe it's a smell of mulch as you join in to some of the service projects this summer at Stewart Elementary as we, we build up the, the campus there and invest in a very ordinary way that makes a, a difference to that school and the programs that they can have and we, sh we get a part of our community. Whatever it is, God calls us to live in these ordinary moments so that he can work extraordinary things through us and in us. Whether that's a simple conversation with a friend or a neighbor, a family member, or whether that's daily conversations with your children as you build and invest in them each day. Sometimes it just seems ordinary, mundane, but you're transforming them day by day. Or whether that's joining in a service project that seems just ordinary, like we're not solving world hunger by doing this. We're not doing this big thing. We're not going halfway across the world to go do this thing. We're just raking the leaves for someone who needs help. We're mulching a yard at a school that needs programming for their children or just serving a simple meal to the homeless in downtown Cincinnati. These ordinary things. And then I leave you with this, this challenge. And it's going to seem really weird, but keep coming to breakfast. Keep coming to breakfast. You know, I would say breakfast is the most important meal of the day, but it'd be kind of cheesy, and I already said it now, so I can't take it back. Uh, but, but as we think about what that means, it means it's always coming back to the feet of Jesus. Wherever you are in life, whatever you're wrestling with, whether you feel worthy or whether you feel the weight of whatever's going on in your life, or maybe you're on top of the world, things are great in your relationship with Jesus, keep coming back to breakfast those ordinary moments where you meet Jesus and his disciples in community to be prepared to, to go out, to be a part of ordinary life. You might call it incarnational life, life in the flesh, life as a human being embodied by the Spirit of God, calling people to God. So keep coming to breakfast. I don't know where you are this morning. Maybe... Maybe you need to take a step towards Jesus. Maybe this is your first step towards Jesus. You're not a disciple of Jesus, and you find him compelling. You find his teachings compelling. They're drawing you in. We would love to, to help you take that next step through faith, repentance, baptism, or just talk about what that will look like for you. Or if you're here this morning, and you've been walking with Jesus for quite a while now, like Peter and the other disciples, and maybe through the text this morning or perhaps just through something you've heard in Bible class or your life group, food and fellowship groups, or just something in your own meeting for breakfast with Jesus, that routine of meeting him in ordinary moments. Maybe you felt called to something. Whatever it is, we as your church family can surround you and pray with you for. We invite you to come while we stand and sing. So please come to breakfast. Thank you for joining us this morning. We would love to meet you in person sometime. And if you would like more information about our church, please go to northeastchurch.com.